Fever FM, the number one choice in Leeds. You know, when you made the final decision, decision to leave, was there any violence involved or was it just emotional thing? It was like mainly emotional abuse as well. That happened a lot. Yeah. Emotional yeah. abuse, yeah. But there was no, like, violence. Right, okay. And um, I really, really want you to tell us a little bit, you know, what sort of help you did find at Anna Project when you made the initial move. So when I did make the initial move, I got a lot of support from them. Because when I first came, I had no clothes, no money, no toiletry, anything. Mm. So the type of care, like, stuff they gave me was, like, toiletry stuff. They gave me money, like, to, obviously to buy clothes for myself, for me to travel, things like that. And even money for food because I had no food at all. And I had a lot of support with the key workers there. I did have a meeting, like, twice a week with a key worker. And we had training sessions yes. where we keep ourselves busy. Um, things like self-defence, yoga, uh, mindfulness, so we had like baking sessions, things like that to keep us busy as well. Mm. We did have a curfew time. Right. Yes. To be back for a specific time. Yes. Which when I first came, it didn't really like uh, bother me. Like I had a time to be back because I wasn't one of those girls that be out late night anyway. Right. But I feel like it was good that they had a curfew because that way, you know, the the girls are on, and the girls and the women are on the right path, so they're not out like late night in a club or yeah, you yeah. know how it is. Davinia, you are still here. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, when when you get a person, someone like uh, Selma coming to you, mm-hmm. you know, how do you assess the situation? So I want to just say, when Selma did come, she was very young, yeah. as well. Okay. So she was 16. Yeah, I was 16. So that's a really young age. And that's each person who comes to our refuge or our safe house is risk assessed on an individual basis because right. everybody's circumstance is different. Mm-hmm. So I want to know that and make it really clear that forced marriage in the UK is a crime. Yes, of course. Yeah. It, it, it can't, there's nothing wrong with arranged marriage. That's a cultural thing. If two people agree, then that's all good. It's when the person's not aware of it or the person uh, doesn't agree to it and they're forced or coerced into it. So, you know, emotional abuse. And luckily for Salma, well, not luckily, but there was no physical involved. But that isn't always the case. Mm. Uh, And we do know that there are uh, reported incidents of homicide where people are killed when they don't agree to get married. It does get to the extreme. Yeah. So for us, each person is classed as an individual who comes to us and we will work with that person. We'll do a needs and risk assessment. So by that, we're looking at what are their needs? How can we help them reach their needs? What are their goals? Um, What are the initial safety aspects we need to do? So that's keeping them safe in the refuge and out in the community. Hmm. Um, so we'll give them tools it's about building confidence self esteem and as I said they've probably left everything and everyone as Salma came she had just no clothes no food so we'll meet basic necessities first of all and then build on that can I just ask you know when when they come to place obviously they want their safety they don't want to be publicising where they are and what they're doing yeah does that mean that it sort of disconnects them from all their relationship, all their friends and family? So, as again, I said, we'd have to risk assess that, but usually it's about keeping... So they can still keep contact with uh, certain friends and family, but they would not be able to disclose where the refuge is just to keep them safe and to keep the other residents that are there safe as well. Mm. Um, so we have a really strict confidentiality policy that they, everyone has to sign, and that's including professionals and even myself as someone who works there we all sign a confidentiality agreement to say that we won't disclose where the refuge is um so they don't have to always sever all ties but they would have to agree not to disclose where the refuge are they're not allowed to bring friends back there they're not allowed to have visitors there by all means they can go out into the community and meet friends and family they just won't be able to disclose where the refuge is how do the, you know, for example, parents of Selma, how do they take, you know, this self uh, situation? So I think it's a difficult situation on both sides because ultimately parents have lost a child and the child's lost parents. And I think it's really about moving forward, about looking at 
how there's nothing wrong, like I said, with an arranged marriage if both people agree. Yeah, Salma has clearly said she wanted to continue in education. Her parents could have sat down and maybe had a conversation and say, how do you feel about after you finish your education? Of course. You, you know, but each family and each person's an individual, so we can't blanket and say that everybody can have the same. But ultimately, if she didn't want to participate in a marriage, she has her human rights, which stay in the UK. She doesn't have to no, participate no. in that marriage. OK, you know, obviously this is uh, one of the things that it does happen a lot in our community. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, people are sort of learning from this? Are they changing their opinions and minds about this? Or um, is it I, still on I the don't rise? want to say that it's just a South Asian problem because we know it, it happens in different communities as well. It's not, it's not just to one particular community. We know the traveller community, for example, Gypsy Romanid, they they marry within, they don't marry out. So I don't want to say it's a, just specific for that particular. Fair but enough. we do know uh, you have what's called focus countries and we do know that Pakistan is usually one of the highest focus countries that a forced marriage uh, has taken place or is about to take place. And I want people to know that they have what's called a forced marriage unit. Mm. So if you are taken abroad against your will, um, that you can contact them while in that country and then uh, help will be given to you to, to get you back to the UK. Right, OK. Yeah, I suppose, you know, I mean, we get views from some of the people that uh, they are doing this all for the good of their child. And I, I sincerely think that these parents do think that yeah. they, they do. I, I, I really don't think that there's parents out there who are getting their children married out of hatred or, um, you know, but I... I, I do think that to force somebody into a marriage, we know with that comes an array of lots of different problems. Um, and I think it's removing someone's freedom of choice away, and that can never be a good thing. Of course, yes, yeah. yeah. Although you may be thinking, oh, well, you need to move on, really. People need to move on. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's sad, isn't it, really? It is sad. I think it's about having that conversation with, with your your children you know, have that conversation of how they feel about that person or how did they feel. I think to take a child at 16, not have that conversation and then expect them to enter into a marriage, which will then usually come with sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Can I come to Selma again? Then? Did you have any sort of, you know, these sort of conversations with your parents? No. My mm -hmm. parents didn't speak to me about any any of this. I overheard a conversation. That's the only way I found out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, any of your other relatives, aunties, uncles? No. Or... I didn't have a conversation with them. Well, neither did mm -hmm. they have a conversation with me. Did they talk about this sort of thing in the family at all? You know, about other other people in the family? No, they did it. Oh, dear. Which I found strange because, obviously, I was mature and I am still mature. Yeah. So I think they just thought... Oh, yeah, she's mature. We'll get her married into an inside family, which I didn't agree on. Yeah. And have you obviously not spoken to your uh, your parents since then, since you moved away? or? Um, I've not spoken to them um, when I left home, but um, I have spoken to one or two of my siblings. Yeah. Um, within the past year, yeah. What do they think? Uh, you know, do you think their opinions changed when you moved towards you, or the only thing that obviously supportive? they seen was their sister leaving? But obviously they didn't like some of the younger siblings. They obviously wouldn't know like what had gone on with me. They would have just thought, yeah, the sister had left home. Mm. But um, my sister, who's like two years younger than me, she knows like the story what had happened, and she is like supporting me now. Right. So she's all she knows. She understands like what's happened, and it's not right what's happened. So what do you think? You know, uh, Salma, from your sort of point of view, uh, normal family. You know, you know, girls especially growing up. Uh, do you think they should have these sort of conversations? Yeah, I feel like you need to have that conversation with your children, um, or that child who you want to get married to another person. I feel like you need to have the conversation so that. If they agree or disagree, then, you know, they, they can find another way. But speak to the child, definitely, which I didn't have. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to come back to you, Davinia. Mm -hmm. How can we? How can we get rid of this? Do you think we ever will? 
Yes, so I hope that we will, and that is our goal at ANA. Um, as my role as engagement officer, I'm now going into schools and within the community, educating people on what's a healthy relationship, what's an unhealthy relationship, warning signs. So mm. like we've had the com conversation earlier of how do people spot the warning signs? How do people know they're in abusive relationships? It's through education. Um, so we're really taking domestic abuse is everybody's responsibility and it's everybody's uh, should know about it and should know how and where to seek help but ultimately it's about breaking that cycle of abuse so we're saying by early prevention early intervention starting at the core of young people that hopefully we will break that cycle of abuse so that we can uh, try and el eliminate domestic violence that's brilliant i mean do you think that you know our society needs our people in the community they need to do something about it i think a lot of communities have the mindset of it's a family issue it's not our problem it's nothing to do with us mm. uh, that's their business but i really think that it is everybody's business to safeguard one another um, and to report it you know i'm I'm not saying interject yourself into something to make yourself unsafe, but definitely if you see some some act of violence or you feel something's not right, then you can report that to the police. Mm. Or, you know, even if they don't want to go to the police, uh, I suppose having a conversation, having a chat or trying to change somebody's... Uh, point um, so I'd be really careful about... Um, trying to interject into somebody else's all right okay yeah, um, so then, yeah. yeah so we there's lots of there's a national domestic helpline um that anybody could go to that can offer ad advice um obviously if you're in um immediate danger you would call 999 yes um but if, say, like Salma, she had the conversation with a friend and then their parents did the right thing by contacting the police. Yes. Um, so there's lots of avenues out there um, and, and support agencies across the UK that can help support victims of domestic violence. Is there anything else you would like to tell us about your this not-so-good experience, Salma? I'd say I've come such a far away now, where I am today, to where I started off. I'm into educate. I'm in my education still now, and I'm happy that I'm back into my education. Right. Because obviously my education was taken away from me, so it is a big thing for me. And I do volu voluntary on the side as well. Are you so, helping a little? Yeah. So I've been doing three years um, voluntary work at a youth centre, working with different backgrounds, working with young people. Hmm. So yeah. Uh, you know, coming, I would love to hear from you uh, in a positive message to parents who, you know, sort of do this sort of thing. Uh, there's a lot of families, it does happen and does go quietly and a lot of, uh, you know, girls, they suffer, uh, suffer throughout their life probably. What would you like to say to them? That how can you change this? I'd say my message to the parents is that please do speak to your children and sit them down and communicate with them. I think communication is key. Mm. So that is my message to the parents that do communicate with your children. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Now then, uh, Davinia, can you tell us about your project now? Where we can sort of uh, how people can get in touch, please? A phone number, website? And... Yes. So we have um, a 24 hour telephone helpline. So if anybody needed help, no matter day or night, uh, they can access that on. 08459 or they can email us at help at anaproject.org that's a-n-a-h project.org or they can visit us on our website on www.anaproject.org Oh that is brilliant thank you very much indeed for coming and joining us. No, thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I hope everything goes well for you. Thank you. Thank you.